Hey guys, welcome to a Saturday Superversive uh, live stream. We uh, super Saturday Superversive live stream. There we go. We've got John C. Wright and his lovely wife talking about their new Star Quest Indiegogo campaign, uh, of which you can find the link in the description. How are, is everyone doing today? Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay. Hello. Uh, we we tried joining with the other thing, but it wasn't working. So I will make the handsome picture go away. Kill it, dear. Okay. Uh, Pendragon and I are here. Okay. But how are you doing, Mr. Wright? Uh, I'm feeling sickly. I'm uh, coughing blood, but aside from that, I'm in a good mood. Uh, so, hello, uh, Evil Cow and Pendragon. Hello, Daddy Woodpig. Hello, Ben. Wait, do they, they have code names now? Some of them do. Yeah, yes. code names. Wow. Yes. Why can't they have a Maybe. normal name like Warpig? Does <laughs> Superversive have a code name? Superversive. Who has a code <laughs> name? Wow. Am I the only guy with a code name? No, no, no. That, I don't uh, that's Jim filling in for, for Jason, who is uh, still asleep because it's like the middle of the night. No, Jason's code name is the uh, dirigible. Yeah, which he was saying because it was the dirigible there, but it but it's actually been for you know masquerading as the dirigible. Well, you've just you've, you've, you've just, just outed you've just outed him. Yeah, I'm, sorry I'm about not that. that I'm not that heavy, guys. <laughs> I prefer <laughs> nom de guerre over code name. I always like pseudonym, but that's just me. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, code name is, is, is slightly funnier. It's, I mean, pen name is what it is, but code name is, is funnier because it implies we're all you know. Well, it's a, it's Secretly in disguise as superversity. It's a quote from Guardians of the Galaxy. Ah. Oh, that's right. Um, All so right, I, guys, so we're ready? I have, we Excellent. I have a quick yeah. question uh, as we kick this off. What was it that uh, decided you guys on starting this new Indiegogo? That is an excellent question. Once upon a time, when I right. was alone in a hotel room with nothing to do, and my wife was not there to stop me, and I was far from any of my support, friends, or aid, I watched a movie. That was, I thought, the, the, the next movie in a franchise that I've loved since my youth. That was a franchise that is the most beloved franchise of all of the peoples of the West who opposed Sauron and all his works and all his ways. And, but no... This movie was absolutely terrible in every way, including uh, the the period semicolons and commas in the script. Everything was bad about it. <laughs> it was such a disappointment that my therapist had to commit suicide. That's how <laughs> disappointing it was. He had to dress up in a banana suit and throw himself into the ape house at the zoo. See, if John had only spent the evening with Abe and Pierce and I at the oh, sorry, I'm forgetting who name to at uh, Liberty Con. None of this would have happened. No, no happen. he stayed in the hotel. I am. I got online into this abysmal timeline where I saw the terrible movie. So, as a joke, I wrote up a review of the movie the way it the way it should have been had it had a good plot. And the wife and I and the kids, while we were driving back in the car, just made up a new version. Okay, for free. George Lucas, call your office. We made a much better script in 10 minutes than than you could get from uh, Ryan Johnson dropping him on his head from a tall building. So, so John is getting the order all wrong. <laughs> never ask a question of a husband and wife and never see them next to each other at a at a dinner party because they'll tell the same story but not in the same way. So last year about this time we drove home from a Christmas party and the boys and John said what would we do if we were going to write, you know, the next Star Wars movies? And they made, in, in one hour, they made up a group of characters and some plot ideas. Now I have to ask you, gentlemen, which is the more entertaining story? And my bogus story? Yours is there. It's or, just out of order. Or the truth. And so, so, John, uh, so I got up early one morning and I wrote out a plot line for three movies. Uh The first movie in some detail and the, and the and third one rather roughly. And John wrote up the first movie as if he had seen it. And he wrote a review called The Review of the Movie That We've All Been Waiting For. And this has, you know, been 
spread all over the place now. It was a review as if as if it was written <laughs> as if from the main timeline where I was feeling bad that you people live in the bizarre skew timeline where only a really terrible movie two movies were made. So somewhere around there, uh, John was asked by his publisher if he'd consider writing a Star Wars story type story, not Star Wars type story that Casilla House was thinking of putting out. Uh, and he thought about it and he decided that, that he didn't think he'd be good doing that, but that he could write this. Uh, so we started work on it and we had an outline. He wrote a few uh, chapters. And then the event happened that we mentioned, the, the watershed event of the horror of the night in the hotel with the movie. The movie that he had to watch some of in Spanish so that he wouldn't actually understand the horror of what was going on. And at one point he was saying that how bad it was, a certain scene, and my son who was in the room said, it wasn't that bad. And John said, you were playing a video game. You weren't watching that scene. <laughs> so apparently it was really horrible. But uh, after that, he wrote a 16 chapter review of that movie. And after that, we were sitting around talking and we began talking about what really makes Star Wars Star Wars. And we said, you know, it was like an old fashioned serial. Our plan so far for Stargate isn't that much like an old fashioned serial. Stargate is a different. Sorry, Star Trek. Tired, tired here. I realize it seems like the middle of the day, but, but I was up really late and I just woke up. Uh, so, Star Quest. So we decided it needed more pulse. So we started watching old serials, and John would make notes and go, how could you put this in space? You know, and, and so that he would take some scene that was some crazy cliffhanger scene and spaceify it. And when he spaceifies these things, he made them really big. <laughs> so we decided we needed the new outline. So the, the original plot line is basically still there, but we added a fourth major character. And the fourth major character is going to be the main character in the first book. There's going to be four books now. And this is partly because Nate Winchester, who has been helping us, he's trying to put together a version of his card game that's going to be Star Wars. And he said, I see you have four major villains. You're going to have four books, right? And we were like, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> we hopefully will have, we put up the first book on the, on the uh, Indiegogo, but we'll hopefully have four of them all together. We need money for things like covers and, and stuff like that. So we thought, let's go inside this campaign and, and see what happens with it. And it's funded. It is, it is. And we're almost funded for a forward by Nick Cole for the first book. So and does Nick Cole awesome. take his payment in diamonds or gold? <laughs> that, that's or donuts. Of Nick. Or does he, he take his payment in donuts? One. For those of you who do not know, Nick has the most beautiful, beautiful, lovely uh, opera singer of a wife. And he posts pictures on Facebook of the two of them eating donuts together. Always different donuts, always very pre pretty looking. And uh, so so it is true, perhaps, that, you know, I can't say sure, but donuts may be the form he takes his pain. <laughs> one, of the, one of the stretch goals I wanted to have was have an opera singer, a beautiful opera singer, come and live with me. But my <laughs> wife nixed that idea. She said, I wonder why. Don't, <laughs> you don't even like opera and they're divas. They're all very self-important. I said, No, I'm she gonna... seems like a sweet lady. Oh, she does. She's so sweet. But but Gaji or Nick the, Cole's Nick wife? Cole's wife. It reminds all of you guys are sweet. Of a, of a funny story. So when I was a kid, I, I would go away to college and I'd come back and the the equipment for listening to music in my house had gotten bigger. So it went from like a little record player with small speakers to medium speakers to speakers that were like about as big as I am. Because it was something my dad really liked, was really high quality music. And he had like cutting, cutting edge equipment. And I used to say it would just be too much and I would come back 
and there would just be a little Italian guy actually playing a violin in the corner, you know? <laughs> rid of all, the, all the fake music, there'd be one live musician. So we could have an opera singer sitting in the corner of our house singing. But it's just, you know, we'd, we'd have to feed her, and, and that they, they could get expensive. So let me ask you a question. What is it about, as far as moving on past specific scenes, as far as general principles, uh, a design goal or, or whatever, what is it that you think space opera is? How does that differ from other things? I think space opera differs from other genres in science fiction because the emphasis is not on the science. The science is just a, the science fiction is actually just a background. And uh, it's the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek. Star Trek is not space opera because it actually is a science fiction story that asks questions about the nature of man and uses the science fiction tr tools and tropes to ask the question. Where Star Wars is a fantasy adventure that takes place in a science fiction flavored universe where lasers make beams in outer space and airplanes do bank turns and an evil black wizard lives in a, uh, uh, a round castle the size of a small moon that the heroes have to break into to, to rescue the princess. Okay, those... Those elements, the the, uh, the space opera elements are uh, over the top action, gigantism. Everything has got to be on a huge scale, and uh, uh, the moral questions have to be very simple, very straightforward. So it's good guys versus bad guys. It's not it's not supposed to be morally ambiguous. Babylon Five uh, guys who are overcoming an alcoholic problem and have a divorced wife who are beating up on a, a guy who has a really good reason for committing a theft, like Mr. Garibaldi. He's, don't get me wrong, one of my favorite characters, Mr. Garibaldi from Babylon 5, but he is too morally complex uh, to be in a space opera. You, you can't have him next to space farm boy, lovable rogue, space princess, and, and the comedy relief robots, together with a wizard uh, fighting against space the... Space wizard. Space wizard fighting against the, the dark knight of outer space, the evil emperor, and the giant death moon, known as giant death moon. Okay, Space opera is supposed to be as clear as a parable and uh, uh, forceful in its, in its straightforwardness. Now, you can have, don't get me wrong, you can have intrigue, you can have plot twists, and in fact, if you go back and look at the original Star Wars, there are a, a surprising number of plot twists, and the plot is remarkably well crafted and people tend to overlook the writing in it because they're so amazed by the by the special effects and by the other bells and whistles that you get with space opera so so let me ask this bad writing is not is not a part of it but what it is is space opera is a pulp fiction type approach to writing where you're willing to slide across genre, uh, genre boundaries and you that's why you can have a wizard in space for example pulp type fiction not pulp fiction the movie yeah, I mean, Pulp Type Fiction, not a movie named after it. Okay, just clarifying. Which, and when I say Madonna, I mean the Madonna. I don't yeah. mean an Italian singer. Let me ask you this question then. Um, sure. Looking at it, now, I have been a reader of your book since 2007, uh, when I read your uh, Chaos trilogy. Um, yeah. And I, uh, looking at the difference between the, ten, the types of works you tend to write and what tends to be written by, let's say, you know, any of your typical, you know, pulp authors uh, or say Larry Correa, who's like the closest thing we really have in the modern world to that. Are you, uh, in order to write space opera, are you, uh, are you changing up your style um, from the, you know, big yeah, he's, florid? He's going, first of all, he's actually pretty good at changing styles. But second of all, he has a, an editor and, for this project in the form of his wife. And my plan, following the, the wisdom of Nick Cole, is just I'm going to cross out every other word. Very old <laughs> Now, the disadvantage of having a female editor is she she keeps to try to put in romance. So I'll introduce a character and she'll go, who does he end up with? It's important. Who does Sherlock Holmes end up with? Okay. It is important. It's important. All the guys in the pulps have, have gals. Who does Luke Skywalker end up with? He ends up as a monk. He does not. He ends up marrying a uh, assassin Marge, 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 yeah. Marge, There you go. go. See, you get, you get your answer. Anyway. Uh, yes. 
I have a chat question. I am circle friends with a Zetter. That's correct. I didn't hear the comment. Say that again, please. Uh, I've got a chat question from a friend of Superversives, Ben Stevens. Can space uh -huh. opera be planet bound, or does it require spa uh, being in space? What would you call a terrestrial bound space opera? The terrestrial bound space opera romance. is called planetary romance. The uh, uh, Princess of Mars, which does have a space princess in it, Deja Thoris, who's incomparable. And it has the best swordsman of two planets as the main star. Is not a space opera. It's a planetary romance. Planetary romance is the genre where a Earthman, by some contrivance, even if he has to die to do it, wakes up on another alien planet, which is both futuristic and more primitive than Earth, and he has to whip out a sword, fight battles, rescue princesses, and do other deeds of daring do. Uh, alien beasties and uh, dinosaurs are always good. Uh, if you can throw in Wula the space dog, the ten the ten legged space dog, that's even better. But it's not the difference between a space opera and a planetary romance is in a space opera you blow up at least one planet. In Star Wars it was Alderaan. <laughs> in the latest Star Trek movie, uh, it was uh, Vulcan got blown up. The uh, start when they re when they rehashed Star Trek to make it Star Trek Lens Flare, that one uh, blew up planet Vulcan. Uh, the lensman the, uh, always moving or blowing up planets. In the Lensman series, yeah. I, I don't even remember where the first planet they blew up was. We basically, the Lensman is one of the models that we're looking at for this. Uh, as a, you know, one of the first big pulp beast style space opera. So we're trying to make something that, that's part 1940s serial, part Lensman, part... Uh, Star Wars, and just a little bit of, of Babylon 5 in there, too, because there's some political mathematicians in the background and stuff like that. Not something we, we, we really want to spend a lot of time on, but the second book will deal with that. So what um, when you're looking at plot elements to, to lift, um, obviously one of the one of the key parts of a space opera is to... It, it's almost like an action movie. I mean, it's you know fast-paced, bad guys, good guys. I mean, if Die Hard took place in space, it would be a space opera movie, or could be a space opera movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although, yeah. although yeah. the stakes put on are... Space station. Yeah, put it on a space station, Die Hard could be a space opera movie. So, what uh, what kind of things are you looking at uh, to to help move your, um, you know, to move plotting and, and your uh, your writing style and stuff more in the action movie direction? Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to use my tried-and-true method of uh, stealing ideas from smarter people than me, which I've used my entire failed career, and which I don't see any reason to, why I should change now. So for my opening sequence, I decided uh, to take, almost unchanged, the opening to one of my favorite serials, Spy Smasher, where the hero, to show that everyone needs a hero, uh, immediately gets into a fight scene in the opening credits, gets caught, gets the, the, it's not being out of him, and gets tortured, and then is killed. But he, uh, it, it's, a, it's a head fake. He's not actually as dead as he looks at first because he is a character. And uh, the, uh, uh, the French uh, resistance uh, fighter helps him against the Nazi executioners. It's actually a cool scene because the guy who's ordered, the local police authority who's ordered to shoot him is his friend, and they just don't shoot him. Or they shoot <laughs> It's Clever than that. They shoot blanks into him and they shoot bullets into the walls next to him so the Nazis watch and see the ricochet, see the, the, the bullet hole in the wall next to him. You know, and then he falls over. And because it's a 1940 serial, nobody's expecting to see any blood anyway. And they just dump the guy in a coffin immediately. So John just so put that in space. I'm just going to say, I'll do it with space guns and a space coffin and space Nazis and space French resistance guys. Actually, space pirates. Space pirates. Oh. And, yes, and he, he, we are keeping the initial opening that John wrote. The, 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 pro, the prologue will still be the same one about the little girl and her planet getting destroyed. Uh, whether it's exactly the same or not, a different version. It, 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 it's the same, but, uh, and then it will, it will launch into this uh, Lancelot Lone fighting space hunter. Lancelot Lone space pirate hunter is the main character for the first book. So allow me to be a little bit malicious here. Um, I, again, like I said, I've read, you know, I think I've read just about everything that John has written that isn't published by Tor. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, deepest apologies for that. Um, 
Sorry. But, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm wondering, um, and this is just a guess on my part, I'm wondering, despite the fact that space opera doesn't focus on the science fictional aspects of uh, building a, you know, alternate physics and things like that. How uh, involved and complex uh, is the alternate physics you've developed behind the technology of the book? It's certainly complex because I have a brain malfunction that doesn't allow me to write simple things. So I'm going to just try to keep that not on the page. It's just going to be in the background, referred to briefly, yeah, so or one, not at all. One of the so that my, my plan is to... Instead of having a, a police procedural, if I may use an analogy, a police procedural is a story where you give out the exact details of how the police solves crime using scientific methodology. I'm going to have the opening to the third Batman movie where Commissioner Gordon comes on the view screen and says, there's a new villain in town, Batman, get him! See, that's the, that's the plan. But in the back of my mind, I'm going to know what the police what the police did to find the criminal in case but it comes up. You're spot on, Daddy Warpig, with the fact that John has made up a very complicated, uh, you know, three different types of, of fast and light drive. Four. But one of our major conversations we're constantly having here is, okay, is it, you know, can I say this? Is this too much? Is this going to push it into science fiction? And so he's trying to have this all in the background, uh, and I'll explain why, one thing about the background for just in just a second. And then only mention it in the lightest touch in the actual text. And notice notice that the, if you ever read Doggy E. Smith Lensman series, in that book, he does make up an alternate physics. He says in one or two places what the rule is, and he draws out the logical implications of it. He says you can have fast light drive if the body being moved is inertialess. If, if bodies in motion no longer have a, a tendency to stay in motion, bodies at rest no longer need any energy to accelerate them to to infinite velocity. And one of the implications that that makes is you'd have to fight with space axes rather than with with bullets. You can't you couldn't use a kinetic impact of a bullet against an inertialist body. See, so he so he's the best of both worlds. Now, he doesn't dwell on the science of his ultimate science, but it's in the background, it establishes some neat rules about his universe and he sticks with it consistently. Okay. In John's normal style, he's made up over 24 races and 12,000 years of history. Yeah. But most of that will not be in this series. But one of the plans of Superversive Press is that hopefully, in the hope of doing rapid fire release like they do for uh, Galaxy's Edge, that they will eventually get to other authors to also write in the same background. So the background of the different periods of time, the different technologies and the different races will be available to anybody else who wants to join in and write in the background. So while right now we're shooting for something that's kind of a pulpy, pulpy space opera, a more science fiction story could be written in the same background if, if somebody else wanted to. Yeah. No, there's another factor too. When I read Pixar's Mars, I was actually quite impressed with the fact that uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs had the correct uh, year uh, Martian orbit length, the correct distance and period of the two moons. Uh, his only mistake was he thought the moons would be visible from the surface and they would just be dots of light. They thought they would be big, big bright orbs like our moon is. But he got his, he got his astronomy information correct, really only in the background. You don't even have to, I mean, obviously, you wouldn't even notice it if you weren't a science fiction guy. So I, I, I'm doing the same thing. My, my Star Quest does not take place in the galaxy long, long ago, far, far away. It takes place in the Andromeda galaxy, far in the future, well, next door by half a billion light years. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, the astronomical information about the Andromeda galaxy is, is going to be correct. For example, there's two supermassive black holes in the middle of the Andromeda and a micro quasar there. Uh, the, the, because of uh, the agitations of some of the satellite galaxies, the spiral arms of Andromeda have been disarrayed. They form two ring systems, an inner ring of stars with massive dust clouds everywhere. And so those features are going to be in the... Uh, referred to, but not, not dwelled on as science. Well, just, just to give me a name so I can say, so yeah. I can say where so-and-so is so -and -so, you know, yeah, exactly. go, go there and blow up that planet. So I, I can, so I can go there 
or say go to the alpha quadrant, I could say go to the outer ring, go to the, G, the G1 clump, go to the shelf, go to the warp. Other things made up. There's no Kerberos star cluster. There's no Nastron star cluster. There's no dark sun nebula. That's just that's me. So. But it's going to be a struggle. I'm going to have to struggle against my inner science fiction writer. I, I feel that loss from the last continent, which is my my series that I was doing periodically for free on my blog, uh, I found out it's a lot harder to do pulp than it, than it looks. It's, it's an art form. It's like painting cameos. It's, uh, I, uh, I don't think that, I think that, I think I, I, uh, if I ever put that book out as a book, I'm going to go back and change the beginning because I don't think I, I, I think I think had missteps at the beginning and I had too, too, too slow of an intro into the main action. Um, so looking at uh, honing your skills as an action writer, um, has it been difficult to learn the art of writing, you know, fast paced uh, or faster paced fight scenes? <laughs> I'm sorry, I coughed in your question. It, has it been difficult learning um, the skill of writing faster paced fight scenes? Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't, don't get me wrong. Space opera action is different from action action, and that was one of my mistakes. If you, you said you haven't read any of my tour books. The, the second and third book in the Count to a Trillion sequence is just a fight scene. It goes on for 10 chapters. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's exciting as all get out. But it's science fiction-y action. It's not space opera action. See? Space opera action. Well, one thing John, that's very true about John, and, and we saw it much more when he was moderating than you do in the books, because he can do moderate all sorts of things in, in a weekend, and a book takes a long time. To put out is he can copy almost any uh, move. When in the game he used to run, we would go to the Star Trek world and it would really feel like a Star Trek story, and then we'd go to the Greatest Empire from Van Vo and it would feel like a Van Vo story. And he was really good at copying another author's mood. So you know what he's got to do for this is is pick you know the guy with the shadow or E. E. Doc Smith or something, yeah. and then kind of copy the mood. And then my job is to make sure that he doesn't slip back into his normal kind of more literary and highfalutin science fiction -y writing. But I've seen him, you know, tell whole stories that are, you know, a Jack Vance story and then, a, you know, a Tolkien story and things like that. And, and he's really pretty good at copying uh, the mood of another story and, and fitting. Now, usually in the game, part of the point was, we were messing with it, you know, that you had stormtroopers in Oz or something, but he still managed to put across the the native world quite well. Oh, so I my, think he can do that. Even in my writing career, I wrote a Jack Vance story that made it into the yeah. Jack Vance yeah. anthology. I wrote a, a. Van Do I wrote the sequel to A. e. Van Vo's yeah. Mel A. books with the uh, permission of the of the widow. And uh, I mean I've written other yeah. I've written other books and other and other and other authors of backgrounds every yeah. now and again. Yeah. Nightland is 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 all takes Night place Landy. in in yeah. uh, uh, William Hope Hodgson's background. And your your fantasy has you know very is different too. But we're, I'm talking now about the the lighter writing style and the vocabulary and stuff. And I I've seen you do things like that in in games. So I assume you can you can do it in writing. And if not, I'm there to cross out every other word. Yeah. So uh, are you still in the midst of writing the first book? Yes. 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 He actually started the first book and had part of it done. And after our revelation about it needing to be more serial-like, he has moved backwards. So, yeah, I, I, so I looked at the, what I had so far, and I, I said, needs more pulp. And so I tore up a bunch of pages and threw them out, uh, uh, storming around the room in artistic frenzy. Oh, no, wait, I don't act that way. I looked at it logically and he said, this is, not, <laughs> this, is not, uh, this is insufficient. Uh, you have failed me for the last time. I carefully arranged a stack of papers on a chair around my desk, and I pushed a button, and it sank down out of sight like a James Bond film. Then there was a flash of flame, which is very different from the way artists do things. I didn't raise my voice. All oh, this is. So, weird. is there a? I still like the beginning where the girl has her son blown up, and both her parents are killed, and uh, she gets saved Sun by the by the annoyed Sun Irish Sun Irish robot. Sun you not yeah, yeah suddenly you. you. Yeah. 
Her star, her home star gets. She, she's still w- w- kind of she's still a character. primary character, yeah. but she's she only she's going to be more of a, a secondary character in the first. But what movie. I what I showed people, what I showed my fan, the next, the first chapter I originally had was her at school, her at the Jedi Academy, and uh, you know, girl at school is not the same opening as space princess being open fired upon by stormtroopers. You know, and uh, oh, there's no, there's no escape for the princess now. You know, that's just not, not the right opening. So one of the things I think is really cool is that John had done all this research on pirates for a different story, and he had this whole thing to do in this other story based on a real pirate and some really cool things that this real pirate had done, and we realized that it would fit much better with the space. So he's taking this real story from real pirates and putting that in space and that that's going to be kind of the, the that's just kind of the skeleton for the plot for, for the point. that's going to be chapter four and five it's not going to be the whole it's, it's not going to be even part well, of it, 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 that's it'll, it'll, be, it'll be chapter four so we have a question uh, from the yes. outside seats. So will each book in the StarQuest series be a standalone story or are they all going to be direct sequels of each other I do not believe in standalone stories. I wish I did. I would increase my sales if I could. No, it's all going to be one story. Uh, it, it's, it's just going to have four, four episodes to it. Yeah, it's like a serial with four episodes. Each, if you think of each book as an episode or, or a series of episodes, and it will, but each book will have a particular story that is resolved within the book, a, a particular uh, one of the villains will be the the adversary, and he'll I'm, be beaten in the book. I'm doing it the way they did old-fashioned uh, serials, where there's a there's a main hench, there's a main villain, and he has four henchmen, and he sends the henchmen to kill the hero every episode, and the, and the henchman, you know, gets defeated, gets killed every every episode. Delightful. So in, the, in the in the serials, they usually you know uh, got away, but. Well, I don't have to do that. Exactly what's you know we we won't say ahead of time whether they get killed or get away or get captured or whatever. But there's four different. John identified four different spheres of storytelling that can appear in these things. One was the space pirates. One is the, the you know the Senate and the government. Well, it was more than that. When I look at the original Star Wars, I said this is actually a collision of four different uh, worlds in in their background. The space princess comes from a fairy tale world. The farm boy is uh, comes from a world where uh, a spiritual adventure, like a medieval knight, he actually turns into a knight. And the lovable rogue comes from a gangster film because he's a he's a crook, you know, who's who's in debt to the mob. Okay, so I said there's at least three different worlds there. So I'm gonna have and the, I'm gonna have that. And so, and the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to make my space knights more like knights. I wanted to make them. Uh, a, the thing about the force that I don't like is it's a little too Buddhist for me, and I want this to be more uh, what I consider to be realistic, you know, more Christian. I guess if that's if that's the right word. More uh, uh, where the force is actually the good guys. The uh, where the dark side is a corruption. The not dark side is a corruption. Balance. Not exactly. I don't believe. I don't. I, I've never believed in the balance between light and darkness. That's but always struck me as being ridiculous. The, Darkness is the absence of light. The four things that he identified were the 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 pirate sphere, the political sphere, the military sphere, and the uh, what do you want to call the the Jedi? The spiritual sphere. The the, 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 uh, the if you notice the Luke Skywalker's adventure is actually a spiritual one, where he undergoes training to open up his inner eye to the to the mystic realities of the universe, his his final scene is a scene of temptation, where the where Satan or whatever you want to call him, the evil emperor, the Lord of Darkness, is there saying, "Surrender to your hatred," and and he had a perfectly good reason to, give up, to surrender to hatred because his dad is the guy who killed his parents, and I mean, Vader killed his parents and and uh, his, chopped yeah, off his hand and. Yeah. Well, killed his aunt and uncle, killed yeah. the people who raised, who raised him. him. But you understand what I'm saying? It wasn't. It was his his final fight scene because it was a spiritual adventure. It was not a fight fight. It was a it was a moral quandary. And the resolution of that was very Christian. It was redemption. Whereas the whereas the sum up of the military 
military battle took place on the uh, on the uh, planet's surface at the same time was uh, a trick. A guy pretends to be dead. He pretends to be a, a soldier. They get the door open. They come in. They blow things up. They they ignite a bomb. I mean, it's it's, it's uh, like the successful end of a of a war picture. So for our four books, the first book will be Lancelot Lone and fighting space pirates. The second book. No. Wait, 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 you're doing it wrong. What? The first book is going to be The Phantom Privateer versus The Space Pirates of Andromeda. Right. And if that title doesn't tell you everything about what this book is going to be like, that may not I be don't the actual title, know. but that's the working title. That's the the working second title. one is, is Shadow Fox versus, I can't remember what we decided. It was like, the, it's something, the, 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 the Inner Circle Matter Space was one of them. The, the, the evil cabal of spies in the government. The Interstellar Illuminati. Uh, and then the third one is Captain Insteel versus the Death Guard of the Empire. And the Dread Empire, thank the you. Dread Empire. And the fourth one is Star Maiden Lirazel versus the Dark Overlords. And she's she's like the the, the, the spiritual one who's, who's taking on the actual evil behind the, the whole thing. So each of the books, I mean, all four characters will... I don't think Captain Ansfield actually appears other than in a cameo until book two. But all four of the characters will, will be ongoing characters, but the, each of the four books will deal more with one of them than with, with the others. And don't get me wrong, I'm taking a lot of inspiration from Star Wars. I, 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 in fact, be taking too much. I wanted to have a, a trooper who is a director as a main character. Well, those, I thought that was a fascinating idea that the, that the movies didn't make much of. Those they turned into, they turned that guy into a comedy relief guy. I want him to be a hardcore military, you know, kick butt. Uh, uh, what 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 did, what did you call it? A uh, diehard guy, you know. Those were the characters the kids came up with in that first hour conversation with Farley mentioned. You know, a a lazy uh, politician. He would originally was a kid of, of you know Leia and, and Han, who's now now a different background, but uh, is actually secretly a, a, a spy master. A uh, you, you are giving me spoilers. Well, it's not the spoilers that, that anybody <laughs> was, couldn't tell from reading the the review you did <laughs> of the first, of the move, movie we've all been waiting for. Yeah. But all I'm saying is that that the the uh, the turncoat death guard and the the politician and the girl were all characters that they they came up with in that first session. In my original rewrite of Star Wars, I had the son of uh, Han Solo be named Napoleon, and Napoleon Solo was a spy for the uh, United Network of uh, uh, Celestial Law Enforcement or something like that. <laughs> We kept the name, but he's got any last name now. Yeah. He's he's Naploon. So the answer to the question is yes. The stories will be one interconnected story, and you've got to buy all four books to get the true pulpy grandeur. And he's got the huge you fiend of aliens who are all based on animals. So like there's the duck race who are really tough and and uh, gritty. The ducks. The ducks are all cynical. And there's a giant spiders. Just is writing a story where his he has a ship where the doctor is a giant spider. You have to make a deal with him each time you want him to heal you. Boy, spoilers. <laughs> Sorry, Just. <laughs> uh, but he, he, uh, there's all sorts of different races. The, the lions, the, the, like the 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 aristocrats who are in charge. I wanted to keep the aliens simple, so that any reader with a single one or two word description would get a perfect picture in their mind of what the alien was like. So I just did the old, old trick of making them lion men, for example, or hawk men, Excuse me, which, I, which I'm taking straight from Flash Gordon from Manga, which has, which has lion men. Yeah, we have to go in just a moment. Our, our, our guests are arriving. Uh, do you guys have any last-minute questions before we turn it over to you? We're looking forward to it. <laughs> I haven't heard Pierce say anything yet. The dragon. Ah, uh, he's just chilling. <laughs> Actually, I do have one question. Yes. The, uh, now that you're pulping it up more, are we going to lose some of the more Wuxia Eastern elements that yes. were in your first draft? Yes. I'm going to keep some of them for the girl character, but everything else is going to be much more straightforward and. Uh, 
I actually want the Knights Templar to be more like real Knights yeah, Templar. I think we're going to make them more, a little more Western, but the girl is probably going to dress the same way, uh, although the color may be different. No, no, I'm not changing the color. Okay. I'm changing, I might change from Shrine Maiden to Star Maiden. Though. Yeah, yeah. So, so, we, so it, she's going to be the same character, um, uh, but everything else is going to be a little more pulpy and a little more... Because there was someone on, on John's blog had made some comments about it being a little too wushu and about some of the type of dialogue and things that Star Wars had that they missed. And that was one of the things that inspired us to go back and revamp. We're yeah, like, the girl, the girl we, needs to we be. We can have more snappy dialogue, you know. We, one we, thing, we, the girl needs to be spunkier and. Yeah, and, and, uh, there is a ja a Chinese TV show called Perfect Couple that we watched with our daughter, that has this extremely spunky girl who goes undercover and does crazy things and has, you know, uh, thief friends and you know gets involved in a marriage to try to to, to impersonate impersonating one person in order to carry out somebody else's goals and. And we said, and that was the girl I had in mind. And finally, I, I was able to pinpoint to John what I was thinking of. And he was like, yeah, that girl is, would make a great personality. For and because character. he's from a Chinese show, no one in the West is going to know who I'm stealing ideas from. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I also hear that the um, founder for the Knights of Templar, or the Jedi, however you name them, is pretty awesome. Let her go first. Go ahead, April. I said, I hear that the founder of the Jedi slash Knight people is pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> She's talking about Charlie. <laughs> one, of the, one of the early founders. I, I wasn't going to change the, the, the that guy. Oh, I, think, I thought you said you were going to make one of those guys. On a giant iron death throne? I can, put him, I can put him in a hover chair like Professor X if you like. <laughs> what about like a chair like a stompy chair? Well, give me what about a, a, a rocket hover chair? Is that good? Yeah, that works. Later. We can go back and forth with some emails. All right. What were you saying, Hanson? Oh, uh, I, I was just asking what aspects of Wuja don't fit with the space opera. I'm, I'm assuming it's not the sort of high flying combat. Oh, no, no. The, the, I, I thought Star Wars was a Wuja film that was westernized. So I thought Lucas did that deliberately. My, uh, but the I, I put a I put a, a what was originally going to be chapter two out on my blog for people to read, and uh, uh, one of the comments I got back that it was very it was very uh, he had long complicated descriptions of exactly what she was wearing and how she did her hair in the in the shrine maiden fashion and how they made their floors and other oh. things that were very wushu and not space operated because of course I did I I. I wanted to portray a shrine maiden realistically, but that was my science fiction brain taking over my space opera brain. See, it's there is a piece of detail, and there's no in town, Batman. Go get him. You lost him a while ago, April. Yeah, that's that's the epic fiction disease. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Say again. That's the epic fiction disease. Um, <laughs> No, that's the that's the too much research disease. You got to um, you got to got to parse down your research to a minimum. For example, I I know I know what the seven ritual objects are that every shrine maiden carries, but in my in my first draft, I, I I described all seven things when the girl was getting dressed before she was gonna sneak out and do her spy stuff. This was before yeah. it came to his editor. Who was epic epic was fiction books. Epic but fiction books. That, now it'll be if she has the object, she'll have it and she'll use it, and there won't be a big thing explaining it, unless there's one, you know, one line of snappy dialogue explaining something particular. I also was just going to start with her. I was going to start the story with it later in her career, and if opportunity arises for a flashback to explain her sad backstory, that's fine. But she's going to start as a full-grown, you know. I also don't like the idea of female knights. It just offends me. So she's going to have psychic powers. But she's not going to have a lightsaber. She's not going to be a fighter. She's not going to be a, te a Templar with a ghost sword. She's going to be a Star Maiden with a uh, this really cool bow that lets her shoot spiritual arrows through things. Ghost bow. It's a ghost bow, ghost it's, bow. It's, but it's meant to exercise evil spirits. Yeah. The fact that she can kill people with it when she's actually projecting and they can't see her is just a side effect. Yeah. 
So, yeah. So we're, we're trying to keep some of the good ideas from the earlier versions, but make them feel more like something you would see in a in a serial or something like that. You know, what where is, it's a lighter. Okay, we got to go because we, we have guests. You guys, you know, can chat among yourselves, and hopefully we can hear what you say later. And thank you so much. Thanks, Jaji. Thanks, John. Faith in me. Thank you. Because you sound really skeptical about my ability. <laughs> what I don't we should have is... <laughs> no, I think Ben had great questions. It helped draw out a lot. Well, no, I, I, I appreciate the questions, but I hope I can... I hope I can restore his faith in me. I can do pulp. It's hard. It's a lot <laughs> harder than it looks, but I can do it. Look, all I'm you not gonna, is... what's going to happen. I'm going to keep trying to do this until I make it. Okay? <laughs> so no matter what happens, no matter how bad the first book is, the last one will be the best thing ever written. Okay. He'll, he'll send it to me. I'll send it back. It'll keep happening until we get something we're both happy with. That's right. I think right. April thinks that, that Ben was asking all the questions that I was asking. Oh, okay. And then Daddy Warpig. Good job, Daddy Warpig. Yes. Because yeah. I'm Daddy Warpig. I'm allowed to ask all the mean questions. April, yeah. you, you got to keep the code names in mind. What was your code <laughs> name again? Dancing <laughs> Cow? I am La... Uh, no, 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 no. In Spanish, because, you know, I am La Vaca Alvada or something like that. I may, get, I may have got the last word wrong, but La Vaca is cow. No wrong Spanish code name. I think name. we need to get together when we're not live and practice using everybody's code name because I think we've got to remember. I'm the evil cow. That's all you got to know. I'm the cow. Oh, I wrote the foreword to John Delarose's upcoming book, uh, and I'm credited as Daddy Warpig. <laughs> it's a great code name. Well, okay. everyone knows you as Daddy Warpig, so it makes sense. That is true. Yeah. There's too many Jasons. Everyone knows me as John. True. Right. And no one knows my real name, Nostradamus Apocalypse. No one else has. That no one else has. Okay, and Junior, uh, I hope you Think enjoy the rest of your Saturday. John, it's been great talking to you. It's been Thank a pleasure. You. We all, we, you and I need to talk more. Bye-bye. Yes. Because <laughs> I'd like to pick your brain about some ideas for pulp, how to do pulp. Because you're it's, like a, a pulp expert. I will... Okay? Uh, I will confess that the last six months I have dr uh, withdrawn inside myself because I've entered a different phase of creation. And so it's been very difficult for me to pay much attention to the outside world. That, I know that's not entirely healthy and I need to, uh, I need to redress yeah. that. I was warned of that and I have not given that warning the heat I should have. Anyway, on that, that note, adios. Have a good day. Thank you for being here. Though I would buy like the super pulpy version and the super like thick space opera version. Will we get <laughs> the description like... of every single thing? Yes. Well, that's, like I'm that's... reading the worm or uh, the ring or boros or whatever, and like the descriptions in it are utterly stupid, but I'm loving it to death. And that it's like, the... oh no, can't do this. Uh, <laughs> it makes me feel a little better because the story I've been working on. Um, I, I haven't had that much description. It's it's a rather short story, and so it's more focused on the action and stuff that's happening. But it, it's I definitely write very like space opera kind of stuff. Like if you categorize different writing with space in it, um, with uh, like hard sci-fi as a popsicle and space opera as soft serve, then my version would be ice cream that's been left out in the sun for too long. <laughs> oh dear. Um. <laughs> But not in a good way, hopefully. To, not to disagree with John, except that I'm completely disagreeing with John. I, it really is the epic fiction disease. Uh, and it's one of those things that once you get used to something, a different style of fantasy, you begin to notice everywhere and get really aggravated on is that epic fiction, for good or bad, is really, really concentrated not on moving a story along or telling an interesting story, but it's really concentrated on creating an alternate universe and oh. describing this alternate universe in great detail. It's like, dude, no, can we just do the, you know, people doing stuff? <laughs> um, there's enough there that it, as much as token Tolkien is not for having really elaborate backgrounds. The fact is that his elaborate backgrounds 
very often only come in in really small, small ways. Um, for example, at one point, Bilbo is in uh, Rivendell and he's writing a story literally about Elrond's brother and his girlfriend and the tragedy of their lives from several thousand years ago. And all that Tolkien mentions is Aragorn demanding that he put some kind of green gem in this story. Um, you never hear in the Lord of the Rings what that green gem is or why it's significant or why uh, Aragorn demanded he put it in. But, you know, that all that stuff is in Tolkien's background and will come out in like the Silmarillion and stuff. Um, he has a ton of things like that where he has this huge elaborate background to it, but he doesn't bludgeon the reader about it. Like the four hobbits get caught up in a... Um, in, in those mounds with the undead, the barrows, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there is a specific race of people who hated Mordor and fought Mordor and are in those mounds for very specific reasons that he absolutely does not talk about at all, except the tiniest little bit. And then later, in the end of uh, the, what would become the Return of the King, he talks about how... Uh, I believe it's Meriadoc has a dagger that he got in that barrow and how that dagger, he spends less than a paragraph describing how that dagger had been specifically made by human warriors millennia ago to fight against the witch king and his servants, who is the person Mary is facing and how all of their malice and hatred for them was bound up in that blade. And so when he stabs him with that blade, it hurts him very elaborate <laughs> background that you never hear about except in the most sparse ways and that is in it despite the knock that tolkien gets for overworld building he doesn't bludgeon people with more than they need at least in several of those instances it's the collection of the world building not the actual instances themselves yeah. he brings it up slightly and then all of a sudden it's like you're thinking about it, and then, like, oh, you remember what the elves are doing and what their generations are and why Galadriel is important. Except, no, they don't mention really why Galadriel is important uh, until you read the Silmarillion, where it explains yeah. why Galadriel is important. Because she's been around since forever. Uh, you know, and it, it adds so much more to the character. I just, yeah. I just think... I'm sorry, April, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, that's me. Um, but... I I've noticed even he he glosses over things that I wish he would actually go into more detail about sometimes. Uh, right now I'm reading the uh, the new publication of The Fall of Gondolin, and he he glosses over in a few sentences all the uh, the weapons Morgoth's putting together in his army to take Gondolin with, and just kind of casually mentions that and it's it's not the sort of thing people associate with Middle Earth, but he just kind of casually mentions like, oh yeah, Morgoth got his wizards and they basically built giant mechanical dragons and various other what basically Amazing. fighting mecha let me see I'll, I'll see if i can find the page and uh <laughs> get back to you with it but yeah i'm reading that. i'm like wait this is telling me there were there were giant mecha in the first stage he just kind of mentions it and and then doesn't go back to it i just if people uh love in epic fantasy they love doing these huge elaborate things exactly what john was describing you know here are the seven sacred things and then they bludgeon the reader with all of their you know details and tolkien gets knocked for that and he gets blamed for starting it but i don't think tolkien really is the progenitor of that yeah i think that it's you know? a skill to have i think only john can say that he, that you have to do less research <laughs> <laughs> because it's John, but um, that is the skill and advantage of having a really deep background um, in your own head and knowing what the world is, but only, and you, you know it so well that you can slip in small things to the reader, like you're giving examples with Token, but the reader still gets the sense of the whole background um, because the author knows it and so is able to insert little pieces where it needs to be. Yeah, I, th I think that's key. And, and it, it really is sort of a Heinleinian skill. And I don't know that Heinlein did the work on it, but Heinlein had the talent of saying very, very little, but managing to imply that there was a lot more behind it and managing to imply that there was this bigger world, whether he had developed it or not. 
he was really good at that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's one of those very impressive things if you read Heinlein novels is to notice how much you are, you believe that there is this huge world that you're never told about, even though almost certainly Heinlein didn't actually go through and create it. Did you find the passage? Yeah, I found it. Okay. Here's a section from Fall of Godland if you're interested. Go so, for it. All right. Then on a time, Melko assembled all his most cunning smiths and sorcerers, and of iron and flame they wrought a host of monsters, such have only at that time been seen, and shall not again be till the great end. Some were all of iron, so cunningly linked that they might flow like slow rivers of metal, or coil themselves around and above all obstacles before them. And these were filled in their innermost depths with the grimmest of the orcs, with scimitars and spears. Others of bronze and copper were given hearts and spirits of blazing fire, and they blasted all that stood before them with the terror of their snorting, or trampled whatso escaped the ardor of their breath. And then he, he doesn't go into any more detail, but it sounds like giant mecha to me. What was the name of the uh, King of Gondolin? Uh, it was Golian, I think. Something like that. Hold on. So, like, you're telling me the King of Gondolin did not hop into his giant, like, I don't know, Ulmo Mecca and, you know, fought the uh, Turgon. Yeah, so if King Turgon didn't jump into his giant Ulmo Mecca, you know, modeled after the Va- Valar and, you know, wrestled the dragons uh, at the walls of Gondolin before its fall. I am supremely disappointed. No, that's some fan fiction I would read. Well, to be fair, I haven't. We will read that fan fiction. (laughs) Sorry, what was that? Uh, To be fair, I haven't finished the book, so. Oh. um, I mean, we got, it mentions at least one of the elf generals fights using a curved sword, so. I mean, there's a little little Japanese influence in there already. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Actually, though, I, I will say uh, I am a big fan of um, Purple Prose. Uh, and I, I'm not entirely sure why, but like if, if like I'm reading The Worm or Burrows, which uh, some people are like, yeah, I've read it. And then I immediately drowned in the swamp, put it down and, and you know, couldn't do it after they spent like three pages describing a series of pillars in the Demon Land Palace. And I'm like reading it and I'm like, I don't know what these guys are having a problem with. <laughs> and it was apparently like a 20 page or something ridiculous like that explanation of a ring and all the descriptions and facets and everything they're putting into it. And it's like, I dig it. It's, it's, it's one of those things that's like my flavor. And, you know, if you're writing pulp, you just can't do it. But like, I will always, always argue for at least some corner of fiction dedicating itself to writing the most neon-tinted prose it ever could. (laughs) Actually, that would be a good way to describe, like, cyberpunk purple prose, neon prose. Um, I would say, and I'm not, you know, I'm not in the process of telling anybody else what they can or can't do, so people feel free to do whatever the heck you want. Um, But (laughs) um, I would say that it is not a matter of how... um, of the language you use as much as it is a matter of what you're doing in a story. Um, That's true. People, at least in my preference, that people seem to have gotten away from the last long while is that we can have wondrous and marvelous and fictional things while at the same time having a story that moves, that doesn't sit on one thing and dwell for a long period of time. You need to describe things vividly and evocatively because that's what the readers need to be drawn into the story. But if what you're describing ultimately doesn't actually move the story forward, if you're just to borrow a band term, marking time, it's uh, I, I find that tremendously dissatisfying. Now, what I'd be interested in is taking some of those long descriptions, and I don't know if you've ever heard Jaji talk about two strings and stuff, that, like, if you, in every scene, at least you need two ideas going at the same time, or two strings. So, like, um, 
if someone's right, like instead of just having someone drive in a car from one point to another, while they're driving, they're also talking about their plans or events of the story so far or something. So I'd be curious to look at those super long descriptions and see if it's like, like you're saying, kind of moving the story along or having some other little theme in it that helps it draw out and be interesting to the reader. I mean, and the thing about like the world worm Ouroboros or the ring Ouroboros or whatever it is, part of the reason you read it is because the uh, descriptions are so crazy and out there. Like this person didn't just be like, yes, I will demonstrate all the a adjectives I know for purple uh, to describe the King's <laughs> robe. He, he, he actually, the description, he describes everything, right? He's describing every wondrous thing there. But I noticed he actually moves around from subject to subject in a, in a brisk one sentence pace. Now that sentence might be Byzantine and long legged, like I like my women, but <laughs> it's still very enjoyable. Very it, like for what it is, the dude presented it in the best possible way. And somebody who who might not have that skill, might not have that writing sense, uh, might not understand that he's actually like glancing at the room and looking at everything, but he's not spending more than about five seconds of my re reading time on any one thing. Hmm. Or uh, one, one aspect. Sorry. Keep going. Yeah. If you're talking about, let's take an example. C.L. Moore um, has this Northwest Smith story where he gets taken into a place where these, you know, crazy monks have been breeding women for generations to maximize their beauty um, because they feed off of it. And How do the, monks breed women? Um, they're aliens. They oh. make humans oh, and okay. breed them. Gotcha. So gotcha. you should read the story. Uh, you should read C.L. Moore's <laughs> North of Smith stories. So she, he has a description of passing along this corridor where every single woman in these succeeding cells where they're being kept... Um, uh, are more and more and more beautiful and begin to, in fact, in their beauty, begin to be uh, damaging or dangerous because the human mind isn't meant to comprehend this level of beauty. And it is, it would seem, nothing but a long sequence of description. But it's not because she is putting together why these beings are unearthly and why they're evil and what exactly they're doing and showing how, you know, how badly imprisoned these women are. She's drawing something out of it that is more than, let's say, a mere um, uh, king and his captive harem. Um, she's showing that this is not just that. It is something ancient and deadly and evil and, uh, not even something as wholesome as desire or, or lust. It is a, uh, it's a hunger that mere humans can't comprehend because we don't work like that. And it is absolutely ominous and threatening and deadly. This, what would seem to be fairly, you know, well, they're trying to make the most beautiful women they can. That's, you know, that's maybe a little creepy, but that's not unearthly and, and malicious, but she draws it out so you understand exactly how, uh, how bad it is. And it would seem that that's just a long sequence of, uh, of description, but it's not because she's actually building up the world in a way that you need to know to invest in the rest of the story. Mm. That is impressive. Seal Moore is a, is a fabulous writer. She, uh, she really was. She, you know, she was a, contemporary of a lot of the pulp people robert e howard whatever uh but her uh, northwest smith stories are just incredible i would recommend them to to anybody because they on the surface they look like han solo and northwest smith is the archetype from which han solo and captain mal reynolds was taken from han solo was a photocopy of northwest smith but at the same time her stories are not uh, masculine adventure stories they're feminine adventure stories and they're really really different Hmm. Yeah, I have to check her it out. Hmm. I have astounded people. 
<laughs> they are now <laughs> contemplating. Out of to say. They are wondering exactly how something like that could happen. They're like, is he telling the truth? Is that what really happened? I can't imagine uh, that. And oh I goodness. am I am most assuredly telling you the truth. So <laughs> No, yes. I'm just considering how I can use it for my own stuff and, and how I might um, bewilder it so that I can have my uh, delightful purple prose while also at the same time moving the plot along uh, <laughs> ever so nicely. Because uh, right now I'm writing a book called Cyber Gothic, which will be the death of me, but that's okay. That's all right. Um, I, I accept my death. But it's... Uh, but like to to mi to mimic the gothic style, I do need to do purple prose, and like I've been struggling with how how much to do it because like it's also a pulpy thing where like in like three or four chapters they're going to be fighting a giant music playing robot um, that is possessed by a genie soul thing uh, and kills an exorcist and his uh, crow body. Uh, confined dad but you know it's it's one of those things where it's like you get there i want to make sure that everyone sees how crazy this stuff is um at the same time not dominate anyone in, in such a way that they find it unpleasant the point of a story is to make uh, an emotional impact on the reader um it is to drive their emotions so that they're thrilled or whatever uh they're thrilled or they're touched or they're uh, horrified or whatever. The difficulty is uh, a lot of what some variety of writers focus on is entirely intellectual, and they get a great deal of intellectual pleasure from contemplating those things. But when you're writing for an audience, and I'm not saying that's bad or wrong. I mean, I get a great deal of pleasure out of contemplating history and thinking about societies and how they develop and stuff like that but when you're writing a story you cannot expect that your audience is going to get the same sort of intellectual satisfaction from uh your imaginary societies as you do some might but you can't assume that and you need to make sure that you have actually written a story that will make an emotional impact on the reader not just assemble mm -hmm. something that will show how clever you are, how neat it is, or how much, look, you see how closely this resembles the uh, mercenary companies in Italy in the Renaissance period and, and how cleverly <laughs> yeah. I have wrapped that around uh, the Shogun of Japan. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the daimyos and how they were uh, fighting for control. And, and now they put those two things together. <laughs> Isn't that clever and cool? It's like, and then the rager's <laughs> asleep. Now, I guess one good way to be able to have your deep descriptions is first you have to get your reader invested in the character. And then if you can have the reader see through the character's eyes and feel the character's emotion as they see all the different descriptions you're trying to portray because then they're still connected to the character in the story. And then they do that can invest into all the other descriptions and things you see. I'm going to say, if only it had been Mongols instead of samurai, you could have called the whole thing Genghis Condottieri. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys see what I have to live with. That's funny. <laughs> it's the, the problem with way too many writers um, it, it, and this, I'm not saying this is the only problem. Heaven knows this is not the only problem that writers have. Um, oh, no. <laughs> is that they are clever and they want the audience to know how clever they are, how clever they've been. And they uh, just writing a simple adventure story that thrills and moves the audience doesn't prove to the audience how clever they are. And so they want to make their writing clever so it's big and complicated and so that the audience will stop and say, oh, look at that turn of phrase. That's so awesome. He's so <laughs> clever. You're or, only going to get that when other writers read your stuff. Yeah, it just... Uh, or look at that, you know, world building. That's so, that's so clever. It's Stop trying to impress the audience and just start trying to entertain the audience. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's going to go much, much better. I have an example in dance form. Um, 
like as a dancer watching another dancer, I can be like, oh my gosh, look at that flatte, or did you see the way she rolled through her point shoe, like all the little details. But the audience just sees, you know, the pretty dance. And so my, one of my teachers told a story about they were doing a dance on stage and they had just done this huge card combination thing. And then the next thing in the dance was they all kind of stopped and like all just re- lifted their hands together. Uh, and then the audience went wild. <laughs> So, it's the difference of, like, yeah, you got to entertain, and the readers will find something that you may you may be like, oh my gosh, this little thing I did here is so clever, but the reader won't really care. They'll care about something else that wasn't as hard to do, but had a bigger impact. Um, and I'll use another analogy, too. Um, at one point, uh, Penn from Penn and Teller, uh, or excuse me, Teller from Penn and Teller. He went and researched this old, old trick that a parlor magician from the 1800s had developed. This guy believed that magic could only be done up close and personal. And so he never went and performed for any audiences. He only did shows in his living room in his house. He had the best magicians of the world coming over to his house because he was better than them. He was better than anybody else on the planet. He had Harry Houdini and all the magicians of the time coming over to his house, but nobody knew who he was um, because he didn't leave his house. He only performed there. That's not the point of the story. That's just, I thought, an interesting biographical point. Um, So Teller went and researched a trick he did that all of these other magicians were wowing over and were squeeing over, basically, fangirling over. Um, If you could imagine Harry Houdini fangirling over something, this is what he would have been. Um, And he spent years, 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 years to master the technique, to learn how to do it, and then to make it his own and develop on it further. And he showed it to Penn uh, once he had developed the trick. And Penn told him the truth, which was this. What you have done is absolutely insane and impressive, but it isn't a Penn and Teller trick, and the audience won't care. Penn would perform, or Teller would perform this trick for other modern magicians, and they would be stunned because they could not imagine how someone had mastered this very, very difficult and obscure method of manipulation. They were flabbergasted. It blew their minds, but an audience wouldn't care. And so they had to find a way to make the audience care. And the way they did it is they gave away the trick. They say at the beginning of this trick, and it took them, you know, a couple of years to come up with this. They say, this trick is performed with a string and a ball. And then they let him perform the trick. And while the audience is there watching it, it's not just going through their mind, the story and the emotional impact and stuff. They're thinking about how, utterly impossible it is for this trick to be formed with just a string because they're trying to see where the string is and how it's attaching it and how he's manipulating it and they are just they are drawn into that moment of being absolutely stunned not just by the emotional story but by his mastery of it and so they found a way to draw the audience in and make them impressed with it And it wasn't until they did that that it became a trick they could put in their show. And it's one of their best tricks ever. So writers have to do that. The audience doesn't care how clever a pun you've just made. They don't care about how clever you are with your world building or whatever. They care about being entertained. And you have to figure out a way to draw them in it. If you're going to put these details in there, you have to figure out a way to make it interesting and make an emotional impact. I only put in world building details to set up my giant robot fights in a way that everyone <laughs> can find acceptable. Indeed. I mean, I, sh- I should think there's some sort of like square law we could figure out about how much world building is required so that people will believe that giant robots fighting can be a thing. If Brian Niemeyer is an indication uh, to go on, it's one prologue chapter. <laughs> I just I, I I think that fantasy and science fiction has in a lot of ways um, in the interests of doing things that are necessary and maybe cool 
they have gotten away from what will make an impact on the audience and that uh, if we could collectively relearn how to make an impact on the audience better, that it would improve uh, the books to no end and kind of unlearn some of the bad, um, some of the bad habits that have been inculcated for decades. Mm -hmm. That is my thesis. Yep. Cause like I've been, I, I'm a big fan of, of like pre pulp era books, like, um, Castle of Otranto, Vothek, and Thousand One Nights, and all that jazz. And I love things that imitate it, but I, I see how it changed over because they these old guys would uh, think nothing of spending so much time describing the castle and and all that jazz. Whereas Pulse would think nothing of, of you know rushing to get their detective jumped by somebody who wants him off the case now if he knows what's good for you. See, you know. Uh, and I think there might be a connection there. And then uh, I was, um, oh, I, I wish I knew who, who said this. I think it was maybe uh, David Halquist was, we were talking about the worm over burrows because that's, that's my current fascination. Um, and he said that the, the super long and, and luscious and lascivious descriptions uh, that they went into make sense if you're stuck in winter and all you've got is a candle or a bard or something like that. So there's nothing to do, but if the writer can transport your mind to demon land where everything is covered in gold and jewels and they drink from uh, uh, bejeweled cups and all that jazz. And each jewel has its own description. Um, that's a pretty decent time waster. And it take and it entertains you in a way that we, with our inst like instant gratification and, and like while we've been doing this and I haven't had anything to say and I'm just listening, I often I'm going through my Facebook pages looking for new art, which is um, my non writing hobby, I guess. And you know, I don't need I, I like it. Don't get me wrong. I but I don't need a 50 page description of the fairy castle and all the things that you can do in it and what the protagonist does within it. Um, because I already am transported to worlds of, of great detail and great, great beauty and art and strange ideas that I might not, um, uh, that I might not otherwise have seen if I was as my family was a hundred years ago living on a farm. And, um, feuding with uh, Habsburgs or whatever that live next door because they stole a cow or something, you know. I, th I think it's it's in different time, uh, time that as the times have changed, then you get movies and then you get where you're stuck in it in the farm. Oh, hello. I'm tripping over my tongue now. You got the people on the farm who have nothing to do, so they might like a bit of description or the, you know, they only have the Holy Bible or whatever. Then you have times where people are moving into the cities and they need so much more adventure. And then it changes on and on and on until the SJWs ruined everything. Um, what, do you, what do you think of that idea? Well, you have to be aware of who your audience is and what they need and what they expect. Um, so let me give, uh, someone wrote this once and, I, and it struck me as true, but I haven't, I don't necessarily know that it is. Audiences, let's say 200 years ago, may not actually have known what it was like to be in a medieval castle. They may not know what the stonework is like and what the tapestry is like and what the moss is like. Um, whereas audiences today, we see those in movies all the time. It's become commonplace. And so we don't necessarily need that described. Um, people... So you have different requirements of, of what you're doing based on the needs of your audience. So any writer needs to understand who their audience is and what their audience is doing and what they need to envision the world they're in. Um, and you need to put that in there in a good way. And you have to be very, very careful that you actually know what it is your audience needs and not just what you think it is uh, or that you want in there. 
being a fanboy of your own stuff isn't necessarily the best thing in the world. Um, it is the mark of, an, of a professional over an amateur is control, precision and control. Um, if you look at every single gambling game, you will notice that the rules of it are set up to punish chance and reward control and precision. So the rules of like Texas Hold'em, they exist uh, to punish people who are just drawing lucky cards and to reward people who know how to uh, do other things in the context of the game, betting and reading other, you know, other players and stuff. The mark of every single professional is precision and control. And if you're going to be a writer, you need to have control over your uh, work and know what it is you're trying to do and then deliberately work to achieve it. Uh, a, lot of other, a lot of writers or some writers are really, really talented. They don't have to think a lot about it. They can just throw whatever they want on the page and it works for them, like Stephen King. Um, but the chances that any of us are going to be a Stephen King are, are virtually nil. So uh, err on the side of precision and control and making choices that uh, are satisfying, even if you can't even if you personally can't describe why they're satisfying, even if it's just the sense that, hey, that's good, that's fine. You don't have to necessarily defend it verbally or explicitly, but by all means, the goal in writing is to satisfy the audience, not to satisfy yourself. Mm -hmm. hmm. I had a lot of things there on the way to making my central point, but... <laughs> no, it's, it was... I was fine with it. Um, I'd agree with your point about uh, modern audiences needing less description than back in the day, uh, especially with like all this great artwork we have access to nowadays. Our imaginations already have a lot more stuff in them that we're already drawing from. Because um, I've found cases where an, an author will start describing a character or a location or a place, and within like the first sentence even – my mind's already populated an image from what the author said will then go pull up a bunch of art I've seen or things I've imagined myself. And so the author's already put an image in my mind, but then the author will keep on going with the description. And then I have to start modifying the first thing that popped into my brain. And by the time I get to the end of the description, I'm not really sure what I'm thinking about anymore. I, just, I, I would encourage writers to beware intellectual satisfaction of writing and of the craft and to be very well aware of, uh, of the audience and what they're doing. One of the things I, I found myself doing is I no longer have a weird desire to describe my main character uh, beyond like what he's wearing and his general stance and stuff like that. And then just bring in the, the things later. Like I don't have this weird quest where he has to go find a mirror so he can look at himself so I can reasonably describe uh, him to the, to the audience and other things like that. Like, um, in Cyber Gothic, I have this big masquerade scene which introduces the giant music playing robot. The thing I focus on is the giant music playing robot. And I use that description to give him malice and make it seem like even though he's supposed to be this great, stupid, dancing, music playing thing, uh, you know, occasionally he steps a little too close to the hero as if he wants to squash him, but he can't, like, overcome his programming to do it in front of all these partiers. And nearly gets close several times, but whatever. Um, but I, I feel that it's like, that justifies a decent amount of description for it because of what the giant robot fights I'm setting up in the future versus somebody who's like, and now I will describe every costume the masqueraders are wearing and, uh, you know, behold the, you know, fountain of drinks. And this is how socially conscious they all were. <laughs> Not a single one outside his race or her or its race. <laughs> I, I guess I would say 
that as writers, you almost certainly have adopted from reading books or reading criticisms of books or reading criticisms of books online, you almost certainly have heard and may have adopted a lot of artificial uh, instructions on how books should be made to be good. And it may be that as you're writing, you're paying more attention to those instructions than the emotional impact of your story. I would encourage people to get away from those instructions as much as possible um, and I'm not talking about the craft I'm writing. I'm just talking about what should be or shouldn't be in the story. Um, be wary of those and get away from those as much as possible. Strip them out of your mind and your writing as much as possible. Uh, really focus in on writing stuff that moves people and not trying to write things that conform to some abstract notion of whatever. You know, I don't really care for writers who like or sorry i don't really care for like writing rules or, or whatever but what i do care about is when it, like when john c Wright put put out his immense and, and amazing uh the last straw the last jedi review like i could pick apart a whole bunch of his values and how he sees the world from his critical uh work um that i might not uh get because they're subconscious uh, if he wrote an explicit book on how to write something. I think it's just my impression or my belief that people from the pre-ideological age had an innate sense of who human beings were um, psychologically and morally and emotionally, and that their stories that we have lost those same understandings and the understandings we have are all ideological rather than organic and natural and honest and true. And so I think people would be well served to try and strip away what they've learned explicitly and intellectually that human beings are like, and just throw that away because it's almost certain to be wrong. Um, Mm. And I'm I'm thinking about that and I'm I'm noodling over how to better explain that but you know it is what it is people who are who they are and whether they're perfect or imperfect uh and and people are imperfect I'm not you know debating that but if your understanding of humanity has been filtered through what popular culture has demanded that you believe is so for the last 70 years, you're not going to be getting close to the heart of what it actually means to be human. And your characters aren't going to be as authentic uh, and as uh, engaging as they could be. Otherwise beware um, Beware artificial rules that tell you what human beings should be like or are or not. All right. I think that's that's it for me for today. I've got to go. <laughs> okay, no problem. Thank you for joining us today, Daddy Warpink. We should certainly do this next month. Absolutely. I, I hope you folks have a have a, a wonderful day and uh, uh, appreciate everyone who came and listened live and I appreciate uh, 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 people hosting this and I will look forward to seeing you guys in a month. Mm -hmm. Got any final words for us, April? Or bad, evil bad. cow, whatever? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, still keep life. writing, keep working, make fiction fun again. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, guys. I'll probably see me soonish whenever we get some release dates out for uh, some new products for Super oh, Immersive. Quick update. Hmm? Um, the uh, Planetary Anthology is moving forward again. We've got uh, Jupiter's cover almost done. Um, I think after that is Saturn. Um, and we've got, mm -hmm. I don't know if we've released like a list of stuff coming out, but we've got a lot of stuff coming out at the end of the year. Oh, yes. And then hopefully I'll have a book out in January uh, whenever the um, artist comes out of hiding. I, I don't want to have to track her down, but I, I swear I will. Uh, 
Uh, but yes, look forward to our new releases. And uh, uh, I, th- I think Ben Stevens is publishing with uh, his next book in the series in about three months. And I'll, I'll certainly do a thing for that. All right, guys. Have a great night. You too. Later.